Thanks, Chris. I uh, wasn't quite sure why I was invited to uh, talk tonight because I didn't do any big things, do really small things. I have got a big molecule to show you later, so I guess that's a big thing. But I guess perhaps what we are contributing is some radical ideas, and that's because we deal in free radicals. So that's the first pun of the evening. I would want to talk about what free radicals are, because there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what a free radical might be. So in preparation for this evening, I consulted the World Wide Interweb, and I got some really good explanations, mostly courtesy of the cosmetics industry. So in the world view of the cosmetics industry, we start life as a beautiful, fresh-faced young man or woman, and then something happens. We get attacked by a series of small red triangles. <laughs> and that has some rather detrimental effects for us. And in a very short space of time, we get transformed from young and fresh-faced <laughs> into old and haggard. So whatever these red triangles are, they're pretty bad. And we better stop them, and we better spend some money at our local cosmetics store. So can we do a little bit better than that? Can we do some edumacation here this evening? So given that I deal with really small stuff, I thought I'd bring a really large prop. This is a benzene molecule, one of my favourite molecules. You can just call it Barry the benzene if you like, if you want to anthropomorph anthropomorphise this evening. So what is it made up of? Well, it's got six carbon atoms, they're shown in red, and it's got six hydrogen atoms, they're shown in white, and it's got these painted sticks from Bunnings. <laughs> Those are the bonds, right? So they're the things that keep the molecule, the atoms in the molecule stuck together. And so what a free radical is, is hopefully my lovely assistant has uh, loosened one of these bonds. If our molecule has a broken bond, then essentially I've got a free radical, okay? This is a bond now that wants to bond, and it may want to bond with something that's very close to you. So for example, if... Nearly lost it. If my free radical, Paul, would you mind helping out in this demonstration? <laughs> if you could just hold on to this atom and imagine it's a part of your DNA just for a moment. If my free radical comes, it wants to bond, it will take your atom and leave your DNA slightly less heavy than it was before. This is a problem. Free radicals, the free radical then in that DNA molecule could promulgate further and cause more damage. That might cause chronic and immediate damage or it might cause damage that then becomes encoded in the DNA and pops up later in life in the form of cancer. So this is a little bit more of a chemical explanation of free radicals, and it still has this connotation that I guess free radicals are all bad. So we sort of have this picture still that we have to get those free radicals and we have to dose up on the golden life super antioxidant youth formula, which, as you can see, I took earlier this evening. But I guess one of the messages I wanted to give you is free radicals are not all bad. In a happy coincidence, the atoms in my molecule are made of polystyrene, right? Polystyrene is something that we manufacture using free radicals, and we actually exploit the fact that free radicals undergo these chain reactions in order to build useful stuff. So a lot of plastics and polymers are generated in free radical processes. So free radicals are therefore not all bad, right? So what we really want to be able to do is to control free radicals where we don't want them and also control them where we do want them so we can put them to useful work for us. The challenge is that free radicals are so reactive, if I was to make one here out in the air, they will react immediately. So this free radical, for example, which I know and love, will immediately pluck an oxygen molecule out of the air. So how do we study something that's so reactive in order that we could perhaps tailor its reactivity and put it to good work for us. So this is a problem. Fortunately, the great chemist uh, Theodore Seuss has a solution for this. In this wonderful book, which my son loves, this is If I Ran the Zoo, all right? And uh, Gerald McGrew, who's shown there in the picture on the back of the line, has had this problem. He doesn't, he's not interested in the ordinary animals that are in the zoo. He wants the weird ones. All right? And that's kind of the situation we're in. We're not interested in making ordinary molecules. We want to catch and make these free radicals. So let me tell you a little bit about what Gerald wants to do. Gerald wants to... He would say, a four-footed lion's not much of a beast. The one in my zoo would have ten feet at least. 
five legs on the left, five more on the right, then people would stare and they'll say, what a sight. This new zookeeper, new keeper, Gerald's quite keen. That's the gold darndest lion I ever have seen. But wait, he's thought this through a lot. These animals, these strange beasts, might not be so friendly, right? And this is the analogy we have with our free radicals. We're going to try and trap something that's not particularly friendly. So, fortunately for us, he came up with a solution. And it's called the bad animal catching machine. <laughs> so, most beasts are quite friendly, but still in some lands. Some beasts are too dangerous to catch with bare hands. For those that are ugly and vicious and mean, I'll build a bad animal catching machine. It's rather expensive to build such a kit. This analogy holds very strong. <laughs> but with it, a hunter can never get bit. So if we were to learn from Dr. Seuss about how to trap these free radicals so that we could study them, it might go something like this. To find benzene with six hydrogens, you don't have to go far. Just try any old lab, they have it by the jar. It's a colourless liquid, if you light it, it burns. So unless you're a smoker, there's no need for concern. But in our laboratories way down in the gong, we make our molecules very deliberately wrong. In our zoo, we try to strive to make benzene with hydrogens numbering just five. Some would say benzene with five hydrogens, that isn't practical. But we say it's awesome to make these free radicals. But to make these things, chemists will often respond. You must find a way to break the chemical bonds. They're the glue binding all of the atoms together. If you break them, won't the molecule become all untethered? And how would we see it if it doesn't linger? If we tried to catch it, it'd react with our finger. So to catch these free radicals that really can be seen, we built a free radical catching machine. Our machine has a laser, and how do you do? When we fire it, it breaks up the molecular glue, and when the radicals form, we learn of their fate by just carefully watching if there's a change in their weight. Do they add mass or lose mass or just stay the same? We can shine laser light on them just for a game, and to keep the radicals away from the things they consume, we do the whole thing in a vacuum. And the radical beasts our machine can now trap are putting our molecular zoo in the gong on the map. <laughs> I probably should quit while I'm ahead now, all right? <laughs> Righto, so in slightly less lyrical terms, what do we do? Well, we've got our molecule, right, that we want to trap. So we take another leaf out of the wildlife literature we want to trap this molecule, and we want to do it in a vacuum in the gas phase. So what we do is we install a tag in much the same way that the shark up there has a radio tag. We install a charged group on this molecule, and that allows us to control it in an electric field, and that's what our mass spectrometer can do. So if we have a look at these pictures here, which are in stereo vision, right, in that first picture at the top there with just the stick, I know it's not very impressive and it's got my screwly handwriting on it, but basically, that is the mass of this molecule, right? So if I then come in with a laser beam and... It's this one. <laughs> and remove an atom, I can see that the molecule changes mass and I know that I have now a radical inside my machine. What I can then do is leak something in. In this case, it's you know, initially not very exciting. We just leak in air and this radical immediately grabs a molecule of oxygen. So we can watch the reaction. And then what's really exciting is we can come in with different colours of laser light and we can run that over our radical and we can see how it responds. That's important in this context because we believe this radical, <laughs> not this exact one, but the one that it represents is actually playing a role in atmospheric chemistry. So when it interacts with light, that would be the light that we can see, visible light from the sun, it undergoes a dissociation so more bonds break and rad other radicals are released into the atmosphere. We think it's important in this context because those radicals go on and form ozone, which is, of course, good in the stratosphere, not so good for us down here on planet Earth, where if we move through a lot of ozone, we get reactions with the, with the chemicals in our body. So are there applications for this, I hear you say? Yes. Right? We're learning a lot about free radicals, but that's the goal. We want to understand them. We are working with, um, in practical applications with companies like Bluescope 
to make materials last longer because obviously materials are subjected to a lot of free radicals uh, out in the environment. But I really wanted to leave you with the message that it's not necessarily just about the application, although applications are important. I wanted to leave you with the, the idea of fascination. That's why Gerald McGrew wanted to have his very own zoo, because he was fascinated by it. And that's why we do what we do. Thank you. Thank you.